democracies are sometimes more precarious than we like to think. Even when times appear to be good, the economy is growing, the culture is flourishing, democratic systems can be undermined by political short-sightedness. Today, we see how the supposed golden years of our most precarious democracy, the Weimar Republic, did not see significant political consolidation as the same issues of party strike, parliamentary deadlock, and an anti-democratic electorate eventually end in a shift towards authoritarianism. The question is, would you have seen it coming? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a brand new episode of History's Most. My name is Peter. And my name is Alex. Um, I, I will forgive you if you forgot our names, <laughs> because it has been a little while, hasn't it? It has been a little while. It's we been... took a bit of an extended Christmas break. Yeah, it's it's it, it's been around maybe a month, and I think a month and a half. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're, uh, we're happy to be back. We're, we're glad to be back. I hope everyone else thinks that as well. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so. Uh, if you're listening, I suppose you probably do. Um, <laughs> yes, we obviously, you know, churned out quite a lot of episodes in 2020. Um, we put out, you know, an episode every fortnight for the majority of the year. And obviously, um, you know, our, our content is long form, uh, to put it nice in a... In, in a <laughs> uh, to put our lack of editing um, in a in a nice way. But um you know we we obviously we wanted to take a little bit of a break i must admit the majority of the guilt, guilt lies with me because i had a bit of a writing deadline um coming up but that's all in the past now so we are back and we are raring to go in the new year back on our usual fortnightly schedule and returning with the continuation of our series history's most precarious democracy indeed We'll be continuing this for uh, a couple more weeks, I'd say, maybe mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. a few more weeks. Um, we also have a few more interviews lined up in the, the immediate future as well. So, uh, yeah, we've got 2021. I think it's going to be a uh, good year for History's Most. Absolutely. And we've had some interesting ideas as well sent to us by listeners. So, so there is topics um, that we are considering in the, in the kind of longer term as well. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, we, we moving into the new year need to once again um, thank all of our patrons. Um, we paused our um, Patreon uh, charge during um, that period, December and um, November, where we didn't um, obviously put out episodes, which we kind of think is only fair. But um, we do, of course, have to mention our executive producers, don't we, Peter? Absolutely. Uh, we want to thank... Tony Turin and Eustace Abel uh, for being with us for so long. Uh, thank you guys for supporting the show. And, of course, thank you to all of our patrons as well for supporting us. Absolutely. And who knows, maybe in the future we might announce we did a competition last year. Maybe yeah, that's right. Maybe do something similar in this new year. It's exciting. But shall we get on with today's episode, Peter? Yes, yes, I think we, we should. So, like you said before, we are continuing in our, our series on Weimar Germany. Uh, now, it's been, again, because it's been a while, where did we leave off last time? Yes, we, um, our last episode, we talked to um, uh, Robert uh, Gavar about the revolution um, to get a bit more insight into that. But in terms of our, our, our f or probably four part series, it's going to end up being this is part three. And we ended with Germany in a really quite dark place. Uh, mm. At the end of 1923, with the hyperinflation crisis, Hitler's beer hall putsch, and the Republic seemingly um, having, you know, just about hung on in a series of real, almost existential crises. Um, and the years that follow um, that we'll be covering today sort of 
from 1924 to roughly the end of the decade, um, are often regarded as the so-called golden years mm. of the Weimar Republic when compared to the chaos and instability of the kind of beginning and end of um, the Republic, there was at least a modicum of stability. And I suppose compared to those um, two eras, kind of 1918 to 23 and 1930 to 33, um, then yes, the, the, the time in between that we cover today is a kind of oasis of calm. But mm. equally, um, I think, you know, in, in, our listeners will, will come to hear that it's hardly as if it was all um, kind of sunshine and roses through the mid twenties. Yeah, uh, it's only a golden age in comparison. Yes, I mean, um, one historian's put it very well. It's kind of more gold plated, yes. than solid gold. I think that that's something uh, quote. we probably will touch on that because um, there is still quite a lot of corruption and seediness uh, in the Weimar. Republic during these years. And that stability um, that, that we kind of have been desperately searching for, mm, well, we'll hear in this episode, mm. not quite, um, doesn't quite arrive in the form that might, um, might have been hoped for. Mm. Right. Well, shall we get into it then? Absolutely. Um, I think the burning question, I suppose, for, for so many Germans at the end of 1923 would have been the economy mm. um, with the hyperinflation crisis. And I think we touched on the fact that uh, an emergency government under a German politician called Gustav Stresemann um, more or less brought the hyperinflation crisis under control in November 1923. Um, a new currency was issued to replace, obviously, the, the value worthless mm. Um, German mark. It was called the Renten mark or kind of rescue mark. Um, and it was basically a, a kind of quick fix um, to the inflation problem because if the, if the problem is confidence and, um, you know, the value of your currency has collapsed, then at least you can um, basically just simply replace that. Yeah. And they also, at, this, at the same time as bringing in the Renton Mark, enjoyed, um, uh, Stresemann initiated um, negotiations with the Allies. And the, the reason being that, obviously, as we know, the, the trigger for the hyperinflation crisis was both um, the French occupation of the Ruhr mm. and, at a deeper level even, um, obviously, the on currently kind of raw issue of reparations. Mm. So this kind of twin approach of both trying to stabilize the internal economy and secure some sort of um, foreign policy uh, success, basically centered around finances, was going to be key to any kind of economic recovery. So you have the rent and market, and in a way that's the easy bit um, because you just bring in a new currency, it was worth <laughs> the exchange rate was... Um, one Renton mark to one trillion um, former marks. Right. Um, and um, it was like I said, a temporary measure. Uh, in the summer of 1924, the Renton mark became the Reichsmark, which really brought German kind of currency back to um, a state of normality, backed by the gold standard as it was then. Mm. So the currency side is actually, I mean, the the kind of headline of the hyperinflation but it's kind of the the most straightforward part of the of the recovery is you just bring in a new currency um obviously that's not without pain because you have people who are going to lose a lot um, yeah. based on this one trillion marks to one new rent and mark um exchange rate right mm. like we said before people's savings you know you're not getting it back um, the hyperinflation made it worthless. Now this conversion means, you know, it's still pretty much worthless. Um, but, but going to that negotiation, I think, is even more interesting. Now, the emergency government that Stresemann headed didn't last very long. 
and it was replaced with a series of co- uh, coalition cabinets of the kind of moderate right or centre right. But Stresemann, although he, he served as Chancellor very briefly, um, he took on in late 1923 the role of Foreign Minister, and he would hel- hold that until his death in 1929. And over the course of late 23 and early 24, he um, helped bring about his first kind of real foreign policy achievement. And um, this this became known basically as the Dawes Plan, um, named after an American um, banker, Charles Dawes, because it was a negotiation, negotiation between um, the Allies about what to do about the reparations. Now, America had since um, the end of the First World War taken a very isolationist stance. Mm-hmm and often really wasn't involved in these European affairs. However, this one um, they were interested in because um, France in particular had borrowed a lot of money from the Americans during the war, um, and they were now in the course of repaying those war debts. And a large amount of of their kind of uh, fiscal setup of how to repay these debts was based on receiving reparations payments from the Germans. Yes, so the Germans would pay the French, and in turn the French would pay the Americans. Precisely right. So because the Americans had um, a horse in the race, so to speak, Mm. they wanted to see this whole issue about reparations and about, you know, the rural occupation and the hyperinflation. They really needed that to be resolved um, because otherwise they'd be out of pocket. Mm. So a deal was done um, that came known as the Dawes Plan in April 24, um, which more or less... um, stabilized the situation for the time being. Now, the final reparations bill of 132 billion marks remained the same. Um, So, you know, the Dawes plan was uh, condemned, for instance, by German nationalists because, well, we're basically signing up again to this figure that we think is criminal. On the other hand, um, the annual payments that Germany had to make were were basically reduced for a period of, of five years up to 1929. And it was agreed that by 1929, there'd then be a reappraisal of the situation and that in the future, uh, German uh, reparations payments would be tied to German, Germany's economic performance. Mm. Um, so in a way, that was quite a major concession because it meant that the burden of the reparations bill, however much the government would have to pay each year, was obviously going to be, you know, in line roughly with how well the economy was doing. So in bad times, you know, they would have to pay less. The other thing that the Germans managed to secure at the Dawes plan, with the Dawes plan, was um, they got a big slice of American credit, um, a loan of 800 million marks, um, was basically lent from American creditors to the German government um, to basically revitalize the German economy, um, allow for large-scale investment that's going to get Germany back on its feet. Mm. So Uh, when you think... I was about to to say, I hope they don't use that that, that loan to pay off France so that France can pay (laughs) off America. (laughs) Well, yeah, the Americans kind of know what they're doing here, don't they? Um, (laughs) They're probably going to get that money back one way or another. Um, But you can imagine that, um, you know, on the one hand, there's a lot of negative reaction. Mm. You know, as I said, the German nationalists think, you know, this is just fiddling while Rome burns. We shouldn't be paying reparations at all. Why are we signing up for whatever schedule of payments? It doesn't matter. Um, On the other hand, Stresemann really kind of... um, (sighs) And, and then hit kind of from his viewpoint and from the viewpoint of the government is that really any concession is is needed right now because, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, the last deal that Germany did with the Allies was um, the Treaty of Versailles. And just the year before, the French had invaded German territory to claim material payments. So, you know, this is, in that sense... A step forward, isn't it? Yeah. And it's the beginning of a of a well, two things that happen kind of simultaneously. Uh, 
a degree of economic recovery and also um, a kind of welcoming of Germany back to the international community, back onto the international stage, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, and these things kind of happen in tandem as the 20s wear on. In terms of the economy, um, there is certainly over the next few years um, significant uh, economic growth, increases in industrial production, which um, return to kind of pre-World War I levels and exceed them. And wages and living standards undoubtedly do rise. On the other hand, actually, kind of 1923, um, there was obviously the hyperinflation crisis. We talked a lot about that in the last episode of this series. Um, but actually, 1924 was, in a way, more difficult for many people in terms of the, the sheer, the kind of raw economic situation. Because, like I said, last episode, hyperinflation, you could game it if you were a, a business yeah. You could pay off your loans. You could take out money and then, you know, repay it a few weeks later. Um, the stabilization was not without its pain. Um, there was, in fact, um, far more kind of um, redundancies and bankruptcies um, during 1924 with this stabilization, this kind of painful process of um deflation but also moving to this currency where a lot of people are going to lose out and significant cuts in government expenditure so i mean only 200 i mean only but only 233 um german companies went bankrupt in 1923 whereas more than 6000 german companies filed mm. for bankruptcy in 1924 um you also had the fact that like i said the pre -men already mentioned the government cutbacks i mean the government laid off about 300,000 um, civil servants. So you can imagine that, you know, at least to begin with, this probably didn't seem like a glorious economic yeah. recovery to Germans at the time. And there was, you know, not a little bitterness about people who felt that they should get compensation for different things that happened in hyperinflation and with the introduction of the new currency. Um, so it, it, hyperinflation isn't just like this one-off few months. It has a kind of long tail to it. Mm. Um, and, and there is some real hard years in the immediate aftermath. Not only that, but even as the 20s wears on and the German economy really does benefit from American credit, American loans, and like I said, industrial expansion expands, wages rise, and the government is able to introduce... Um, things like a real comprehensive unemployment insurance scheme, um, which is, you know, quite ahead of its time in terms of how generous and all-encompassing it was. On the other hand, unemployment itself um, fluctuates, obviously, over, over the mid to late 20s, but it's never really brought under full control. And the, the most serious economic problem that, that persists throughout the decade is that German agriculture, um, you know, the farmers and landowners really, really struggle um, through the 20s. There is a crisis that's, in a way, not specifically the government's fault, brought on by the First World War. Mm. In the First World War, obviously, the production of, you know, basic foodstuffs um, by the combatant powers... Um, you know, Germany, France, Britain, obviously, to some extent, was hit by having to fight the war, conscription, this sort of thing. And as a result, there was a massive increase in those countries, obviously, trying to produce as much as they can, but then also large grain producers, like, say, the United States, really kind of stepping into the world market and trying to basically sell their agricultural goods to these countries in need. Mm. What that meant was that by the time you got to back to the mid-20s, we're back in peace conditions, the economy is kind of leveling out, is you have massive agricultural overproduction. And German farmers are having to compete with various international producers, like I said, not least the United States, which is basically driving down food prices. Um, so although um, 
you know, farmers actually probably been one of the winners of hyperinflation because food prices had meant they could basically profiteer off it. The mid to late twenties was a really kind of devastating time for um, German agriculture. Mm. So the economy is well. Stresemann himself said, and it's a very famous quote, often used um, when discussing Weimar. He said, "You know, Germany is dancing on a volcano. If the Americans call in their loans, this prosperity that we're enjoying will just melt away." No. Yeah. So how long does this does this can this go on for? Well, um, I think many of our listeners will be familiar with what comes at the end of the nineteen twenties. Mm. Um, the obviously Wall Street crash, and when we get there, um, it'll become clear that you know Germany is not in a good position. Yeah, you know even compared to its European neighbours because of its reliance on American credit, which is obviously going to be <laughs> not um, not really forthcoming once things go south. That that in vol- New York that volcano erupts. Indeed, yeah. But in the meantime. You know, with not wanting to skip too far ahead, you know, for much of the mid to late twenties, it would be fair to say that Germany was, at the very least, enjoying the outward benefits of um, an economic kind of boom. Mm. So we've talked a good deal about the economy during these early golden years, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, but wait, we should probably talk about the political nature of Weimar Germany during here because as again as we've said before uh, during the early years it's incredibly unstable uh, Mm -hmm. in the final years it's incredibly unstable Uh, what about these these quote unquote golden years how golden is it in uh, the Reichstag this is um, I think quite uh, hmm I think there's this it's often labeled as more politically stable Mm. and on the surface you could say yes because you don't see, I mean, in our previous two episodes, the level of political violence, you know, assassinations, uprisings, putsch attempts, this sort of thing. You don't really see that um, in the mid to late 20s. So in that sense, yes, it's more stable than armed groups attempting coups <laughs> um, yeah. on, a, on a semi-regular basis. And it is not as violent as the early 30s when you kind of see a real kind of uptick in um, polit- political street violence. Mm. On the other hand, I think it's going too far to say that the golden years were politically stable. Um, between 1924 and 28, you kind of have this game of musical chairs um, with a... Or, you know, almost um, every six months or so, um, a change in government. And, involving doors. Yeah. it's On the one hand, yes, that is very unstable. On the other hand, um, during this period, 24 to 28, there is actually only two chancellors, um, Wilhelm Marx, a kind of moderate politician of the Catholic Centre Party, and uh, Hans Luther, a kind of technocrat, um, a former kind of civil servant and um, economist, um, who both had a, a number, actually, of kind of centre-right coalitions. Um, so in one sense, yes, it's this revolving door. In the other sense, uh, it's kind of just reshuffling the same pack every time. Yeah, um, Marx, I think chairs four different cabinets at this time. He's, he's head of four different governments, Luther two, um, over this four-year period. So yes, there's frequent kind of cabinet crises that result in a fall of government, but then a new one is formed with mostly the same people, often the same chancellor, um, and a lot of continuity in some offices. Like I said, Gustav Stresemann remains foreign minister through this whole time period. Um, Otto Gessler remains defense minister from the early 20s through to 1928. Um, So it's often kind of just this reshuffling um, of, like I said, the same pack rather than a full-on change of direction. Mm. Um, That said, I would say one of the most significant political changes that definitely did occur 
was the presidential election of 1925. Um, in February that year, Friedrich Ebert, who got a lot of coverage, um, has had a lot of coverage in this series so far, he was the president of the Republic since 1919. Well, he died, um, aged just 54. Um, he, he had appendicitis and he didn't get it treated. He just thought, oh, it's nothing. Mm. Um, I just good, got a pain good, in my tummy. <laughs> good idea. Um, but he, yeah, and he, he died. Um, now that obviously necessitated a presidential election. And presidential elections were very interesting in the Weimar Republic because they didn't use, um, they were they were a bit different from the Reichstag elections, um, which we've we talked about, I think, in the first episode about the electoral system they used and the pros and cons. Mm. A presidential election was um, slightly different. It was um, electing an individual, like, say, you know, in the United States, where there's a person's name on the ballot paper rather than a party, yeah. necessarily. Um, but a candidate had to win in uh it had to win more than 50 percent of votes cast so they had to have a majority um of votes cast which is quite unusual um mm -hmm. you know I, I think a lot of american presidents have been elected on less than 50 percent of the vote um but if nobody got more than 50 percent which you know is, is probably quite likely it's very difficult to get you know more than half of all votes cast in any election um if anyone, if no single candidate achieves that, then what it said was there would be a second round. And in the second round, um, quite simply, whichever candidate got the most votes would win. Right. It's complicated. It sounds like <laughs> yeah. it sounds like qualifying in some kind of sport. Yeah. Well, actually, yes. The first round kind of was a qualifying round because it was clear no one would win more than fifty percent. Yeah. So it's kind of like measuring which candidates have a chance and then, you know, other candidates could pull out and pledge their support to this person, you know, in exchange for concessions, things like that. It encouraged basically, um, you know, unity candidates or joint tickets for the second round. Mm. It's very um, bizarre. It's a very interesting way of running things. Yeah, it's not uh, too dissimilar. I think the French presidential election works fairly similar. It's It, it has a two-round thing where the top two from the first round then go into a runoff in the second. Mm. Um, it's not quite that because you could still have, you know, everyone who ran in the first round is allowed to run in the second. You don't have to withdraw. Mm. Um, and also people who didn't run in the first are allowed to run in the second, um, which is an interesting twist that comes about in 1925. Mm. So what's going to happen then friedrich ebert we know um was from the spd the social democratic party so he was associated with the center left and you know he more than really one could say any individual was responsible for the founding of the weimar republic mm. now we know that a large portion of the german right was kind of opposed to the republic and to the idea of parliamentary democracy so the uh, an organization um was set up that was going to try and bring together various right wing parties and organizations and um you know pressure groups that wanted to basically agree on a joint candidate and the the kind of hope was that they could win this election they would get a right wing president elected and that the extensive powers we mentioned, and I thought also in the first episode, I think, when we talked about the Constitution, you know, and we discussed this as well when we talked with uh, Robert Gavarth, um, mm. that if you win the presidency, there is such powers given to you, you could basically overturn democracy from the inside, right? Mm. You could pass decrees, you could declare a state of emergency, which basically voids all the freedoms in the Constitution, and use it to create some sort of more uh, authoritarian or at least semi-authoritarian system that the political right would be more happy with. <clears throat> Foreshadowing. <clears throat> <laughs> Indeed. So, um, back in 1919, 1920, when it was thought there would be a presidential election, um, Paul von Hindenburg was considered 
uh, or nominated, in fact, by the two biggest parties of the right, the DNVP and the DVP. But um, the cat putsch had basically put paid to any plans to have a presidential election at that time. And Ebert had basically been allowed to continue in post. Mm. Now, by the mid-20s, by 1925, Hindenburg's 77. Um, and the president, another weird thing, by the way, the president was going to serve a seven-year term in Weimar, um, mm. which is strange kind of <laughs> choice. Um, <laughs> they were meant to basically... It's because the president, unlike in some countries... Um, the president was supposed to be non-partisan. Um, they oh, would right. basically be like a the commander in chief of the military, but also like a non-partisan head who would help um, Parliament, the Reichstag, to to form governments. Basically, in a way, he was supposed to be almost like a chairman who would help, who would facilitate um, cabinet negotiations to for, so that the Reichstag could form a government um, mm. because primarily this was supposed to be a parliamentary democracy. It wasn't supposed to be a presidential system yeah, like you'd see in the United States or France, for example. Um, so Hindenburg's probably a bit too old for this seven year term. It would mean he'd be 84 by the time his term finishes, which, you know, um, I know these days <laughs> <laughs> ages are kind of getting on a bit um, for these presidents, but back then, obviously, you know, people would probably think he could die at any moment. Yeah. Um, so the committee kind of semp- uh, basically came up with a compromise right-wing candidate, a guy called Carl Jarez, who was, um, you know, an experienced civil servant. He'd been a mayor uh, for a long time. He had served in the in the cabinet um, in the recent past. He you know, had a, basically a good track record in, in conservative politics. He was a member of the DVP. So he's got pretty much the whole German right behind him. Against him, you've got actually the kind of moderates and centre-left don't field a united candidate. Um, Wilhelm Marx, who I've already mentioned, was fielded by like, the Catholic Centre Party. Uh, the Democrats, the DDP, fielded a candidate, and the SPD... Um, fielded uh, Otto Brown, who was Prime Minister of Prussia. Um, you also, going back to our very, very, very first episode, um, <laughs> Eric Ludendorff was ran as the Nazi candidate right. um, for the election. Uh, that was all part of an internal kind of power play within the Nazi party that we probably don't need to get into. Um, Maybe one day, and, but not on this one. <laughs> yes, Um and the communists also ran their leader, Ernst Talman. Mm. Uh, not only that, but the prime minister of Bavaria and the head of the Bavarian People's Party, Heinrich Held, ran. I mean, no chance of winning because, you know, um, Bavaria is just one region. Yeah. It's not even the biggest region. Um, so you can see that they, they were kind of taking advantage of this first round type thing to basically, because it's a bit of a free hit. Mm-hmm. Um no one is going to win outright, so everyone's going to give it a go. Um, and you can imagine that this doesn't produce a decisive result. Yeah, I'd assume, um, I'd assume not. It It's a crowded field for a presidential election, isn't it? Um, yeah. And um, Jarrah is his kind of united right-wing candidate, does come top, but he only gets 38% of the vote. So, um, you know, he's not only he's well off that 50% you need to win, Mm. but also um, the combined candidates of the kind of moderate and uh, left parties, that's um, the SPD, the DDP, the Democrats, and the Catholic Centre, those three candidates together got 49%. Right. So the obvious thing to do then is for the kind of pro-Republican parties to settle on one candidate and they are going to surely win. Mm. Um, you know, the right's already united and they got 38. If the moderate and the left unites, you know, they're on course to get 49 in the second round so long as all the voters turn up. Yeah. So this leaves the kind of um, Reich block, this uh, center, this, this right-wing committee in a bit of a pickle. 
because they've put a lot of stall into we need to win the presidency. But um, if they carry on with Jarrez for the next round, they aren't going to win. You know, mm. They are a long way behind. And it was only, I think, um, three or four weeks later, the second round. So um, the DNVP, the Nationalist Party, which is part of this committee, really thinks, right, it's time for us to get the candidate we wanted. Not Eric Ludendorff, who got 1.1%, as we mentioned in episode <laughs> one, and um, you know was basically politically uh, ruined by that. Um, no. Instead, they opted for his wartime partner, um, Paul von Hindenburg. Ah. 77 years old, as we say, yeah. but a living legend. A living, a living legend. That's, that's the way that you get the vote. Yeah. Exactly. Recognizable and, and name. He, he is. He's probably the most famous living German yeah. um, at the time. He, you know, uh, is, like I said, a war hero who, because of the stab in the back myth that we talked about, his reputation is not in any way um, dented by the fact they lost the war. Yeah. Um, it's easy to easy to do when you shift the blame to things that exactly. aren't really real, just conspiracy <laughs> theory. Exactly right. So this guy is untarnished. He mm -hmm. is popular. He is well known. He is known to have um, right wing sympathies. He's a German nationalist. You know, a, a lifelong um, soldier in you know first the Prussian and then the German imperial armies. Mm -hmm. In fact, in 1926, he celebrated. Uh, 60 years of military service. Um, so, you know, yep. a, a a perfect candidate for the nationalist right. In fact, he privately had admitted that he was a, you know, a DNVP voter. Mm. Um, however, the issue was persuading him to run. I'm um, too old. Well, yes. Now... The, the classic image of Hindenburg as, as a president, as a politician, is this kind of bumbling old man who's slightly senile, who doesn't know what's going on. Um, now, I, I, I would honestly say I think that's quite um, inaccurate. Mm. Now, when he was first approached by the Reich Bloc Committee, Hindenburg said exactly what you just said. He said, no, I'm too old. I, I, you know, I, I support Jarrah's. It's fine. Don't. You know, I'm not going to do it. Um, however, the thing that I think is is um, overlooked in that view is the fact that Hindenburg was very aware of his own mythical hero status. Mm. He was, you know, he had deliberately helped to cultivate it um, and and protected it. And in his kind of um, letters kind of rejecting these approaches. Um, he basically listed a number of reasons. Um, now, instead of, my interpretation would be, instead of these being, I'm not going to do it because of this, this, and this, I would rather see it as him basically implicitly setting out his conditions so that he can appear like the old man who's been forced out of retirement to save his country, which is precisely what would bolster his own myth. It's, it's actually precisely what happened in 1914, because he'd actually retired before World War I started. He was that old mm. um, and was called out of retirement to take command in 1914 of, a, of an army on the Eastern Front. And he you know, won an amazing victory. And that was kind of the foundation of his myth. Um, and... He basically set out these conditions of, look, I need all patriotic Germans behind me. So not just the DNVP. He basically wanted the right bloc um, and Jarez to basically endorse him. Um, and that he, he, he wouldn't run if, if there would be any chance of being embarrassed by failure. So basically, they needed to persuade him that the whole right would back him and that he would have a real chance of winning. Mm. A key part of that persuasion came when the BVP, the Bavarian People's Party, uh, their candidate Heinrich Held wasn't going to run, obviously had no chance of winning. But instead of supporting the Catholic Centre Party, which was their kind of sister party, uh, Wilhelm Marx, 
who coincidentally was agreed as the united candidate of all the kind of pro-democracy parties, um, they chose to back Hindenburg if he would run. Hmm. So it showed that, you know, the whole kind of spectrum of the German right would be behind him. Um, so he was in a in a series of meetings in in early April. He was basically persuaded to run for presidency, and Jarrah's um, withdrew in his favour. So he ran as an independent. He wasn't a member of any party, but he he was endorsed by pretty much the whole spectrum of the German right, from moderate right parties like the BVP I just mentioned, through even to the Nazis um, okay. on the extreme right. So this kind of set up this very um, interesting presidential election between Wilhelm Marx, who was, you know, unspectacular, you know, not a great public speaker, really, but was an established statesman and was endorsed by all the Democratic parties. Versus a a literal living legend. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) A literal living legend, an embodiment, you know, of German militarism, of the Prussian past, uh, you know, an, an open kind of monarchist um, who had kind of no desire. He even said he didn't particularly want to live in a house under which the the um, black, red, gold flag of the Republic would fly. Mm. Um, so basically the presidential palace. Um, but what he did have was not only the whole of the German right behind him, but he had his, as we've said, his legendary reputation. And this made the election campaign a really interesting one because the People's Bloc, as it was called, the the pro-democracy parties, really refrained from the most part from criticizing him. Yeah. Because he was too popular. Um, You know, I've got some quotes here from um, kind of liberal um, journalists and and leaflets. We do not blame the old man. He does not and cannot see the candidacy plays into the hands of Germany's worst enemies. Kind of saying, oh, he doesn't really know what's going on. He's just being used as a puppet. Um, Equally, one of the posters for Marx, um, for Wilhelm Marx, did exactly the same thing. It was an image of Hindenburg's face as a big mask that was being carried by like, um, you know, a capitalist, uh, a Nazi stormtrooper, a German kind of general. It was kind of like all the worst forces of society are using him as a, as a mask. He doesn't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and even more comically, um, a, a DDP, a Democrat Party leaflet, um, read, for the fatherland's sake and Hindenburg's sake, vote Marx. And there was this kind of trend in <laughs> the opposition of, oh, yeah, it's what Hindenburg would want. Yeah. He doesn't want to come he, out he, of his retirement. Yeah, for, for his sake, he's, he's being used by, by the right wing to further their own ends. He, he doesn't actually know what's going on. He, but I, I, it's, that's, that's an interesting dynamic because they know if they openly criticize him, they're just going to damage their own reputation. Exactly. And, and, and that, um, you know, in a way was the real flaw of the Repu- uh, pro-Republican campaign in this election is they didn't take the bull by the horns. They didn't say, look, Hindenburg is not qualified for this role. Yeah. He's too old, et cetera, et cetera. They said, oh, you know, even the Social Democrats said our fight is not against him. Um, mm. I mean, yes, it literally is. <laughs> it literally is, but we just can't say that it is. Um. Now, Hindenburg, from his point of view in the campaign, um, rather ominously for a a guy wanting to be president, told the right block committee, um, I I don't speak and I don't travel. That was the parameters he laid out for the election (laughs) campaign. Okay, right. Um, So all he did, he didn't go on the campaign trail. He didn't address any rallies or anything. Uh, Literally, all he did in the campaign was um he did a uh press conference mm. um to kind of journalists and kind of said that you know I'm I'm you know just doing my duty for my country I'll abide by the constitution um I'm not a militarist you know I I um 
I will obey all the laws. You don't need to worry about me. And also he said um, something along, along the lines of, look, I'm not in a wheelchair yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm capable. Yeah. But also um, he gave a radio address, the first ever political radio broadcast in Germany, mm. um, two days before polling day, um, which, you know, it, it seems a bit kind of, tame nowadays but back then yeah you know the radio is a brand new technology in the 1920s and this is like we've said a living legend um the most probably the most famous living german speaking directly into your homes um yeah. you know, i think that that must have been quite effective um that being said for all hindenburg's personal campaigning was you know quite modest um the right block obviously didn't hold back. Um, yeah. They described him as the savior of the German people. And this fed into his existing myth as the hero of Tannenberg who'd saved Germany from Russian invasion in 1914. Mm. He's coming back to save his people again from this time, obviously from the chaos of Weimar. Um, and the DNVP, you know, the, the nationalist party, without a hint of irony, claimed that he was a man who leans neither left nor right, not towards the monarchy, not towards the republic, but only knows his duty to serve the state and the people. Okay. <laughs> Which, you know, if, if you are, well, A, you know, there's no doubt about his, his right-wing sympathies. Yeah. And B, the idea that you want to elect as someone as president of the republic someone who is not inclined towards the Republic. Um, and that is something you openly champion as him somehow being neutral. Oh, well, he's neutral because he doesn't like the Republic. He, he doesn't like the... Well, I guess that's... I guess it's that them preaching to the choir, I suppose, <laughs> where if, you know, the people who are going to vote for Hindenburg are people who might, may already have in, inclinations against the Republic. Yes, I mean, that is fair. Um, but but also at the same time, I would say there was a big emphasis from Hindenburg personally, from the campaign, and throughout his presidency, actually, that he was somehow non-partisan. Yeah. That his duty was to his nation, to his people. That he had no party interests. Um, it, which it, it's not basically to basically was untrue. It, yeah, it's it's not to Weimar or and it's to Germany. It's it's to that's where his loyalty lay. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. And obviously, you know, um, the campaign made a huge amount of use of his image, of his, um, of his myth. You know, mm -hmm. they deliberately echoed wartime propaganda posters, for instance, which would have resonated, I'm sure, with many Germans, mm -hmm. with similar imagery and things like this, and often many of actually the same graphic designers and artists. Um, and Hindenburg could be presented really as whatever you want him to be. Um, we've obviously seen him there being presented as this kind of non-partisan servant of the nation. He was also presented, you know, as like a family man, strong Christian values, traditionalist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're targeting, if you're targeting war veterans, well, he's your he's your leader. You owe him your loyalty, your yeah. allegiance. Um, if you are right wing, well, he is the savior from Weimar which we are going to be, you know, overturning, hopefully. And, you know, maybe to people not so politically sympathetic, well, oh, no, he's very respectable. Um, he's nonpartisan. He, he'll abide by the Constitution. Don't yes. worry. Here's him saying no. that he will abide by the Constitution. <laughs> Indeed. Nor all the bits where he said, I hate, I hate the Republic. So I think, you know, we, we've basically presaged where this is going. Yes. Um, Hindenburg wins. Um, he gets 48.3%. He finishes 900,000 votes ahead of Wilhelm Marx. Um, and he is elected president. As I say, you don't need the 50% in the second round. Analysis of this election shows that a very significant number of, um, you know, in, into the hundreds of thousands of kind of middle class voters who maybe support the Catholic Center or the BVP or even the Democrats didn't vote for Wilhelm Marx, but instead went for Hindenburg. Mm. And the reason, obviously, you know, is that unique appeal that Hindenburg would have had. Yeah. Um, 
as literally a living legend, as, um, you know, a hero of the nation. And he, you know, the incredible thing is, it was only four weeks late after the first round where Jarrah's had got 38%, and Hindenburg added 4.2 million onto that poll, mm. onto the Jarrah's vote. You know, so to gain 4.2 million votes in four weeks is is, is truly remarkable. The question obviously remained, um, what sort of a president would he be? Yeah. Um, and actually, the interesting thing is that we've talked so much about his myth, his reputation, his legend status. The first kind of months and years of his presidency really built up a whole new strain of the Hindenburg myth, which was Hindenburg, the guardian of the constitution. Mm. Um, because he had pledged in the election to abide by the constitution. And at least on the outside for the first couple of years, he did exactly that. Mm. And this was a really pleasant surprise, surprise for Republican supporters because someone they feared was about to destroy the system was kind of assimilated into it um, and acted as a constitutional head of state. And it was kind of like, well, if, if, if Hindenburg can accept the Republic and work within the system, you know, mm. who won't, Yeah, if you see what I mean. Um, and on the other hand, actually, a lot on the nationalist right were really embittered. Um, and it wasn't long before, ex, you know, extremist organizations like the Pan-German League were calling him literally a traitor um, because he hadn't... Um, come in and ripped up the constitution and, and created a dictatorship or created some sort of more authoritarian system. Mm. Um, now, obviously, that would have been quite difficult and probably would have required someone more, not only politically capable, but maybe just younger and more energetic. So the right wing is is angry with Hindenburg Mm -hmm. their idol and their hero for so long. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? I think people at the time were surprised. Yeah, um, It was unexpected, and it was seen, like I say, Republicans could kind of trumpet this as a, a triumph for the, for the democracy, a stabilization point, if you like. Um, and a, another kind of triumph was the fact that Hindenburg basically decided to go along once he was in office with Stresemann's foreign policy of negotiation with the allies known as fulfillment, basically mm. let's fulfill the terms of the treaty of Versailles, but let's negotiate towards their revision. And in 1925, he was elected. And obviously um, there was a, there was a government under the man I've already mentioned, Hans Luther. Uh, this was the first actually government that the DNVP, the nationalists, had actually participated in, which was another kind of taken as a sign of stabilization in that what was at that time the biggest part of the German right was kind of actually taking a share in government responsibility and doing uh, participating in, in democratic politics. Now, they resigned from the government over what Stresemann did, but Hindenburg actually um, was persuaded to approve it, and that was negotiations with the Allies, which culminated in the Treaty of Locarno. Mm -hmm. And the Locarno Pact, on the face of it, doesn't actually give Germany that much. Um, Germany had to accept the western borders um, that the Treaty of Versailles had laid down. So things like the loss of Alsace-Lorraine. Mm -hmm. And they had to, well, all the signatories, which was um, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and Belgium, had to agree not to use invasion or military force to settle disputes between them. Um, on the other hand, what Germany got out of it was the eastern borders, which is where most Germans had more of a problem, with, for instance, the so-called Polish corridor, the land given to Poland that cut off uh, Germany from East Prussia, which remained part of Germany but was kind of isolated, um, those frontiers were left as potentially to be revised in the future. 
no promises were made, but it was kind of implied. The key thing about the Locarno Treaty, I would say, is that Germany is basically welcomed back into the family of nations. They are admitted into the um, League of Nations the following year, and they'd been mm. denied the place in it by the Treaty of Versailles. But it, the key point is that they are now talking to you know, the other European powers yeah. again. Um, and they are being treated almost as an equal, as a, you know, a power that is to be negotiated with instead of dictated to. And Strasman's achievement really here is that he has got the kind of enmity and hatred of the war years out of the system of the Western allies. And he's able to deal with them as kind of an equal partner. Mm. And that's going to lead to more kind of concessions in the future. Um, but equally, you know, at the time, you know, as I said, the DNVP resigned from the government because it's accepting stuff from Versailles, which is seen as totally unacceptable. But over the kind of next few years, um, as we've got this prosperity growing, um, as we've got Hindenburg as this father of the nation type figure, in fact, he was known as kind of the father of the people, um, often also kind of nicknamed the old man or the old gentleman mm -hmm. um, as a kind of figurehead for the Republic, which is a, you know, potentially persuading more people to support it or at least put up with it. Um, and, you know, he was actually, for all his, his faults, I would say, he was a genuinely popular figurehead and he did do what a kind of role that um, is called a kind of, uh, by historians, something called an ersatz Kaiser, a replacement Kaiser, or, or kind of like a, a modern day monarch, in that he, you know, he went to places and crowds of people turned up and waved, and you know, people were, you know, hysterically kind mm. of um, would chant his name and have their portrait in his house. Sorry, have have his portrait in their house. Yes. Um, and so, in that sense, as the kind of father of the nation figure as a figurehead, um, you know, I would say he was a successful president. On the other hand, though, um, that isn't the role that the president in the Weimar Republic had. He, he had a more active political role. Mm. Um, you know, there is some countries today that have a, have a figurehead president without any real powers, and Hindenburg would have been well suited to that. But that wasn't um, <laughs> the case. And as time went on, you know, he had very clear political preferences. Um, he basically put his foot down a number of times in the mid-20s to prevent um, a grand coalition being formed, which would have involved SPD joining forces with moderate and centre-right parties. Mm. Um, there was a governmental crisis in late 1926 and early 27, brought about by the revelations that the German army was secretly um, uh, carrying out training and rearming in the Soviet Union. And this was one of Weimar's other foreign policy triumphs is they, they kind of had a close relationship with their fellow prior state, the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of getting around Versailles. You, you could experiment with tanks, planes, this sort of thing that they weren't allowed to have in the vast expanses of the Russian steppe. Now, when the SPD revealed this in the Reichstag in December 1926, it resulted in a no-confidence vote, and the government, um, which was headed at that time by Wilhelm Marx, obviously um, a defeated presidential candidate from the year before, um, his government, centre-right government, fell. And Hindenburg really stepped in to play a very prominent role in the formation of a new government. He didn't want the SPD to get in in these cabinet negotiations. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, he saw what they'd done in revealing Germany's secret and illegal dealings as being basically treason. Right. What he wanted was his preferred party, the DNVP, back into government. So he basically, in January 1927, put heavy pressure on both... Um, the Catholic Centre Party and the DNVP to basically come to a deal to come together and form a cabinet. Um, you know, like I say, more or less ruled out the other options and said, look, you've got to do this. 
and laid down kind of conditions that would enable this government to to come into being, mm-hmm. which was going beyond, you know, supposedly non-partisan status. Um, you know, he wasn't being neutral here. He made it very clear what type of government he would like. Yes. And therefore the parameters in which the politicians could negotiate. He was also at this time increasingly being advised by a guy called Kurt von Schleicher, who at the time, I think in, in late 1926, early 27, was only a major, but he would become um, within a few short years a general of the German army. Now Schleicher, um, his name in English means um, creeper or sneaker. <laughs> and it's actually really quite accurate. It's quite apt. Schleicher was the very model of a political general. Um, Mm. He was, uh, in the 20s, a liaison officer between the defense ministry and the parliament. And by the late 20s, he would become, he would have his own department created called the ministerial office or the office of ministerial affairs, which basically made him the, other than the defense minister, the basically the political head of the military. Right. Um, and he was, um, you know, a real kind of backroom fixer, a real kind of political um, operator, if mm. you see what I mean. Mm. And his authority derived from both his ability to express the opinion of the army, often just his opinion, but if he could say it as, well, the army thinks this, yes, you know, that has a lot of influence, um, particularly in, you know, Weimar, which is so unstable. But also, really strongly, particularly from 1926 onwards, is he develops a close um, personship with the president. Now, obviously, Hindenburg, a lifelong military man, cares about what the military thinks. Mm. And Schleicher, as a, you know, as a skillful kind of negotiator, as a um, also quite a charming man, I believe, um, basically ingratiated himself with the presidential palace and came to be Hindenburg's basically closest advisor. Because, you know, he could speak the language of a military man. He could speak the language of a Prussian aristocratic officer because he was one too. Um, So he he really had an in there. He was also good friends and um, contemporaries with Hindenburg's own son. So, you know, he had an in with the House of Hindenburg. Mm. And at this time, Schleicher suggested, look, if these negotiations fail, you could appoint a government that relies on your authority as president, not based on the parties in the Reichstag, not based on a majority in parliament, but instead a government based on your authority. Um, now, he, the negotiations succeeded mm. and a government came into being, but this was an idea that, you know, was basically, he planted the seed. Yeah, it, the, the something implanted in his mind which mm. exactly right now this um, right wing government that Hindenburg had done so much to create in January 1927 um, basically they all fell out with each other by January 1928 Nice. Um, the issue this time was the Reich school bill um, basically in a coalition stretching from nationalists to Catholics to moderate liberals, um, you, they couldn't really agree about education, um, you know, things like faith schools, yeah. and this sort of thing. Um, and there would be elections due in 1928 anyway. So Hindenburg persuaded them to carry on for a few months, pass some vital legislation, and then we'll call an election. You know, get the budget mm. done, this sort of thing. And in the election... Um, to um, Hindenburg's dismay, I suppose, um, the SPD, the centre-left Social Democrats, did very well. And um, there was a real kind of swing to the left as it was interpreted at the time. So it was inevitable that a new government would have to be formed that would involve the SPD. It would be this grand coalition I've mentioned, stretching from the centre-left SPD through to the DVP on the centre-right, which was Stresemann's party. Hmm. And the the tricky thing was that um, the SPD had campaigned 
their election campaign had been focused on what was called the Panzerkreuzer. It literally translates as armoured cruiser. Um, they are usually referred to in English, though, as pocket battleships. Mm. Um, the German Navy was preparing to build a pocket battleship, um, a new modern warship that would have the firepower of a battleship in, in the size of a cruiser. Um, because of the Versailles terms, they had certain limitations. Yeah, I was going to ask, on, yeah. Yeah, on the size of warship they could mm. build. So this was like a way around it. But obviously this would be very expensive. And, you know, the SPD's election campaign had kind of been quite kind of graphic in like, oh, while ordinary Germans are struggling, while some people are starving, we've got money to go off and build this big war machine. Mm. Um, it's, you know, it's disgusting. So you can imagine the reaction of Hindenburg, Schleicher, and the new Minister of Defence, Wilhelm Gröner, um, who incidentally was um, Hindenburg's kind of number two at the end of the war. Um, we mentioned the gröner abert Pact in our very first episode of this series. Yeah. Um, he was now Defence Minister, and this kind of trio that were obviously extremely influential were pretty horrified at the prospect of these traitors almost um coming into office nevertheless the new chancellor um herman muller um was a very well respected um social democrat hindenburg said he, you know he actually thought he was his best chancellor it was just a shame he was a socialist mm. um and the grand coalition would last for nearly two years which in the life of weimar government is long but it was not, I would say, um, particularly successful. There was a few real, real difficult points that, that would frequently flare up. First of all, the gap between the participating parties. In the actual negotiations to form the cabinet, the sticking point was between the SPD, who um, were affiliated with the trade unions, and the DVP, which was affiliated with... Um, the industrialists. So mm. you can see that interests are kind of diametrically opposed. Yeah. And eventually it, they came to an understanding, the, the leaders of these parties, that for the time being, the, the cabinet would be what's called like a cabinet of personalities or a cabinet of individuals. Mm. So it wouldn't be a coalition between the parties. It wouldn't tie the parties together. It would just be some individuals cooperating. Right. Now, that, that wasn't permanent. They eventually negotiated something out, but it just shows you how far apart they were that, that particularly the party machines, if you like, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't really be able to agree with any of the government did. A good example was one of the first issues they had to deal with was the Panzerkreuzer. Right. And as you can imagine, imagine Hindenburg kind of put his foot down with the full support of the defense ministry of, no, we are building the Panzerkreuzer. But the SPD, who'd just come into power, had campaigned on not building the Panzerkreuzer. Yeah. Now, the ministers, Muller and his other, his fellow social democrats, basically were um, all overawed by the president of, you know, yes, yes, Mr. President, yes, yes, living legend Hindenburg, mm. we, we should do it, shouldn't we? Yes. Um, they then had to go through the humiliation of their own party refusing to back it. And in the Reichstag vote, they had to abstain from their own government's policy. Um, it was passed because there was a majority for it. But, you know, it, it just showed, you know, the weakness of the government. If even the chancellor can't vote for his own policies without the risk of angering his own party. Mm. And really from late 1928 onwards um and, and getting into gear even more in 1929 um schleicher in particular you know this backroom political fixer is sounding out alternatives how can we move away from the grand coalition basically how can we ditch the spd yeah his obviously main concern was the military and he wanted basically secret rearmament and he knew the social democrats would never basically agree to this his first thought, and, and something that Hindenburg was dead keen on, was let's get the DNVP back, the Nationalist Party. Let's create a coalition with them instead. Um, so instead of having the moderate parties work with the left, work with the SPD, 
let's have the moderate parties work with the right, the mm. DNVP. Let's go back basically to what we had in the mid-20s. The problem was another interesting character of the period, Alfred Hugenberg. Now, Alfred Hugenberg has to go down as one of the stupidest politicians of the era, and there was a lot of stupid politicians in that era. He was like um, a media magnate. You know, he owned hundreds of newspapers. This was obviously in an era where there was thousands of local newspapers, yeah. as well as the national ones. Um, so he owned hundreds of newspapers and magazines. He owned UFA, which was the, the German film industry studio basically had a monopoly over the German film industry. So he he was, you know, a media baron, the, the very definition of a media baron, mm -hmm. you know. And he was also a rabid nationalist, anti-Semite, anti-Versailles, anti-Weimar, anti-democratic. And um, he was elected chairman of the DNVP in 1928, really as a kind of grassroots reaction against the fact the DNVP had been quite moderate in the mid-20s and had participated in government coalitions. Mm. Kind of, you know, um, the party grassroots reacting against the fact that the party leaders had been too kind of conciliatory. No, we want to go back to being rabid anti-Semites, please. <laughs> right. And Hugenberg, obviously, was totally opposed to the Weimar Republic. He was totally opposed to any corporation. So even though Schleicher and Hindenburg wanted to create a government of the right, the main problem was the right, in the form of Hugenberg, didn't want to be in the government. Right. He so wanted the Weimar Republic to be destroyed. Yeah, no... He was not prepared whatsoever to work within the system at all. Yeah, not participating in it at all. Exactly. That's... that's uh... hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of see why maybe this is... Um, not the most, uh, not the cleverest politician in the yeah, world. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm seeing why you referred to him as uh, one of the he, most stupid politicians, even for his era. He wanted to basically, he, he over the course of the late 20s, created what was known as the National Opposition, mm. um, a kind of loose affiliation of far-right bodies that um, wanted to overthrow the Republic at all costs. Um. National really better translates as nationalist. Um, so he was it was a non-starter. Um, so this particular scheme that Schleicher really had hoped wasn't going to happen. The next idea that um, Schleicher had would be to basically to split the DNVP or to force Hugenberg out. Um, and... This was possible because a lot of politicians of the DNVP were really unhappy with the direction Hugenberg was taking the party. Yeah, I'm reminded, perhaps, um, you know, if, if listeners will forgive me for straying into contemporary politics, of um, maybe some of the things going on in the Republican Party right now in America. Mm. You had senior politicians within the party really concerned about the direction it was going, thinking, mm, this is foolish, we need to be more moderate, we need to work within the system. And, hmm. and not particularly liking Hugenberg, his style, and the direction he was taking the party. Um, so there was a series of breakaways from um, the DNVP in the period kind of roughly 1928 to 30. Um, of parties like the Christian Nationalist Farmers and Peasants Party split away. The CSVD, which was kind of this Christian Protestant party, split away and um the kvp conservative people's party split away um led by a guy called gottfried um trivianus who um was a kind of young up-and-coming moderate conservative and also a senior conservative called count kuno von westarp who both were pretty had you know pretty good relations with schleicher and with hindenburg mm. So Schleicher thought maybe, you know, we can create a new right-wing party um, that will be the basis of our government. Um, particularly, he looked at Trevianus and thought he could build a movement here 
that will mean we can exclude Hugenberg. Or at the very least, we can put a lot of pressure on Hugenberg to basically get into line. Yeah. But this fell flat on its feet as well. Um, basically, outside the party machine, these groups didn't have much chance. Um, they were small. Only a small number of deputies, uh, Reichstag members, went with them. I think only 12 went with um, Trevianus. Mm. So they just weren't big enough to form an alternative um, support for the government. Mm. So that scheme had failed as well. <laughs> um, all the while, the political temperature is rising over 1929 because Stresemann's final foreign policy achievement, and arguably his greatest one, was the Young Plan. Remember I said the Dawes Plan, it was going to be reviewed in five years' time on reparation payments. Mm. Well, the Young Plan in 1929, the negotiations around the Young Plan were exactly that. Um, let's go back to the reparations question. And Stresemann won some major concessions. The final bill was reduced from 132 billion marks down to 37 oh my God. billion. So, you know, nearly wiped 100 million off, um, off the bill. The payment schedule was fairly generous. It was set out for the next 58 years. <laughs> Um, that they would pay installments. Um, uh, th there was an end to various allied kind of o allies had oversight over the German central bank, various elements of German infrastructure. That was all brought to an end. And also the allies agreed to withdraw um, their occupying forces. So the Treaty of Versailles had laid down that um, allied troops would be stationed in the Rhineland until 1935. Mm was agreed that they would withdraw next year, so 1930. So basically five years early. Mm. So, I, you know, many people, I would say, point to that as straight, one of Stresemann's greatest achievements, you know, because there's some actual concrete um, concessions, some pretty major concessions as well, that he's extracted based on years of basically oh, improving relations. Yeah. You couldn't have that without Locarno, for example. Um on the other hand, um, you laughed when I said 58 years. Mm. So you can imagine the opinion of the nationalist right when it was announced that Germany would be paying... Yeah, Germany would be paying reparations for the next 58 years. Exactly. I mm. mean, most Germans would probably be dead before the bill was yes. paid. They'd be thinking, our children, our grandchildren will still be paying these bills. So it was a very emotive issue, mm. especially as you know, most Germans stab in the back didn't feel like they should be paying anyway. They shouldn't have to pay anything. Yeah. Um, that it was somehow unjust. So, <laughs> what the national opposition, led by Hugenberg and the DNVP, did was a referendum campaign. And they put to a public referendum, uh, using a, a device within the Weimar Constitution, you could do this, um, to... Um, try and enforce on the government what was called the Freedom Law or the Law Against the Enslavement of the German People, which made it a treasonable offence for any politician to sign the Young Plan. This is all working within the system, right? This is all, is this, this is all legal? <laughs> it was legal, um, but it was outrageous. Yeah. Uh, so there's going to be a referendum on this. It became known as the Young Plan Campaign or the Freedom Law Referendum. Mm. And Hugenberg pulled together as many far-right groups as he could as part of his kind of national opposition strategy. So people like the Pan-German League, um, the Stahlher Stahlhelm paramilitary organization, and also uh, the Nazi Party under Adolf Hitler. Mm. And there is an argument that goes that the Young Plan campaign in 1929 was a huge factor in turning Hitler and the Nazi Party into, you know, a national figure, a national force. Because do you know that media empire I talked yes. about that Hugenberg had? It was basically put at disposal of the Nazis to give them, you know, free, completely free of charge, massive propaganda mm -hmm. um, to a wide audience. Now, the Young Plan referendum campaign was a complete failure. Hindenburg, although he didn't like it, and he especially didn't like the fact that his support of the Young Plan got him a hell of a lot of stick from the right. Um, you know, there was... Uh, Joseph Goebbels wrote a newspaper editorial entitled um, 
Hindenburg, Are You Still Alive? <laughs> and uh, the Pan-German League newspaper ran um, like a souvenir obituary edition to, present to Paul von Hindenburg, mm. even though he wasn't dead, basically saying, you're dead to us. Um, here's the obituary of Paul von Hindenburg, blah, blah, blah. Um, now, the, the campaign was defeated. They got 13.8% um, of the of the electorate, which obviously was not anywhere near what they needed. Mm. But it just shows you that even in these supposedly gold and stable years, it was an incredibly fierce political controversy. Um, you know, you've got people, again, without wanting to allude to things, they are literally going, lock them up. Yes. About the political establishment. Um, it's not a healthy democratic discourse if you are arguing that your opponents who think a bit differently about Germany's best foreign policy options are literally treasonous traitors who need to be arrested <laughs> and put in jail. But there we go. That is a comment on the health of democracy. Um, <laughs> um, so even in this kind of time where you've got supposed stability, a grand coalition that's muddling through, you've got the Young Plan referendum, and into this mix, we throw the Wall Street crash in October 1929. Mm. And as we well know from earlier in the episode, Germany, more than any other European nation, was dependent on American credit. Mm. Yes, America uh, had lend, lend, lent a lot of money to France and Britain during the war, but they were mostly now in the process of repaying that. Mm. Whereas Germany was still borrowing. Um, you know, Germany, as we said, in the Doors plan, a huge loan had really kick-started the golden years. And um, the Wall Street crash means that in a very, very short space of time, those German, those, those, those American loans are basically recalled. Mm -hmm. Can we have our money back, please? Yeah. And the chances of getting more American credit, which was the basis of the economy, um, of the economic growth, well, it had gone to zero. Mm. So, almost immediately in the winter of 1929-30, the government finds itself with a very serious black hole in its finances. Mm -hmm. And this would kind of be a final prolonged crisis for the Grand Coalition government that had just stumbled from one crisis to the next, really. Um Importantly as well for this crisis, Gustav Stresemann had died in, I think, October 1929, either September or October. So he never actually saw the Young Plan implemented. Um, but also his party, the DVP, which he had led so you know, effectively, very quickly shifts from under his leadership, basically being willing to work with the system and being a key part of coalition governments and willing to work with the SPD and the Grand Coalition to its, its more industrialist instincts taking over. Mm. And, you know, within a few short years, it's actively opposed the Weimar Republic. And it, it very quickly, you know, that's in a scale of years, but really in a scale of months after Stresemann dies, the DVP is like, right, we need to get the SPD out of government, mm. which is, of course, exactly what Schleicher and, to a large extent, Hindenburg wanted too. Now, Schleicher had actually really since uh, the spring been tapping up a potential candidate for the chancellorship. Uh, he always liked to work in the shadows, you know, the creeper, mm -hmm. the sneaker. Um, but he'd been tapping up a member of the Catholic Centre Party, a real up-and-coming 44-year-old uh, politician called Heinrich Brüning. Brüning had a lot to recommend him. He was an holder of the Iron Cross. He'd been a machine gun officer in the Great War. Mm. So he'd be the first of what was called the front generation to kind of reach high politics. He was a kind of recognized um, financial expert, which kind of felt like it was needed right now. Yeah. Um, he'd also started out his political career in the Christian trade union movement. So he had ties with the kind of... Um, the labor movement, which would perhaps allow him to, you know, reach out across, uh, across the political spectrum. He was also, though, undoubtedly a conservative. 
Um, and he had, he, for instance, was a close friend and ally of the aforementioned um, Gottfried Trivianus. Um, so, you know, he had ties to the political right, the kind of breakaway groups from the DNVP that Schleicher too wanted to work with. Mm. Now, at first, Bruning, uh, he, they had a conference on Boxing Day, uh, 26th of December, 1929, Bruning with Schleicher and the Defence Minister um, Gruner and also Hindenburg's secretary, a guy called Otto Meisner, who was also quite influential behind the scenes. And Bruning mm, was, had, you know, he had cold feet, basically, about overthrowing the Grand Coalition. Mm -hmm. which, after all, his party was a part of. And he wasn't 100% convinced about the ideas that Schleicher and Hindenburg had about a presidential government that would rule using Article 48, the power to rule by decree without needing to pass legislation through the Reichstag. But over the course of the new year, 1930, um, the Grand Coalition basically stumbled along, unable to come to an agreement on... Um, basically a financial package, a new budget in the face of this gigantic black hole in government finances. Mm. Um, one of the key sticking points really was about unemployment insurance and you know the benefit, the unemployment benefit you would receive, how much it should be and whether it should be cut. Um, and you can imagine probably the SPD were dead against cutting unemployment pay, mm. whereas the pro-business DVP were, you know, absolutely insisting on it. So in March uh, 1930, it was really um, these negotiations basically hit a brick wall. Um, must be said, Bruning did try his best to help come to a compromise. But Hindenburg, um, Schleicher and Gruner's really mind was set on a new government. And having met him at the beginning of the month, Hindenburg's mind was set on having Bruning as his chancellor. So when it finally became clear by the end of the month that the cabinet was not going to be able to reach a final agreement, a final settlement on how to balance the budget, Hindenburg refused Chancellor Muller the right to pass his budget by decree, Article 48, mm. and instead tasked Bruning with forming a new government to be his next chancellor. And he would do exactly what he'd just denied to Muller he would give to Bruning. And the reason, of course, was that he wanted a government of the right and he wasn't willing to give his emergency powers to a social democrat. Mm. But I feel that this story is one for our next episode, the kind of final crisis of the Weimar Republic, which is rapidly emerging in 1930. Mm. I, uh, I would agree. Um, because I think things are going to get pretty, pretty, pretty rough in the next three years. Absolutely. It's, it's, it started badly. The period we've just discussed is supposedly the, the golden years, the stable yes. and successful period with inverted commas. And then the Great Depression, as, as you can see, is just dawning mm -hmm. and it's going to be, well... It's going to be one hell of a ride for Germany, that's for sure. Well, um, we look forward to to hearing more parallels uh, with modern <laughs> politics, because um, well, I, I, I think it, it kind of is an elephant in the room. Um, I mean, we're recording this on January 17th. I mean, 11 days ago, we have had uh, a similar kind of, I guess... There, there, there's, there's a lot of comparisons, right? I think, um, you know, when we're looking at history for lessons from the present, I think, you know, history is a, it's a cliche, you know, but mm -hmm. history um, never repeats itself; it rhymes. Yes, is it a nice phrase? And I think, look, you can't say that things are exactly the same. Of course, you know, different circumstances, different times, but like, you know. Just in the course of this discussion, of course, you know, there's been a few things that do chime, don't they, mm -hmm. um, with with some things occurring today. And I think, like I said, history rhymes. There is similar tendencies. There is similar motifs. There is similar 
um, kind of forces at work, you know, whether it be, you know, on a very basic level, humans desire for power and influence mm-hmm. to on a kind of more complex kind of macroeconomic scale of, of how to deal with, you know, economic downturns, you know, it goes in cycles, doesn't it? And yeah. we, we kind of, I suppose, can draw not necessarily direct lessons, but, you know, you can be, <laughs> I mean, in some ways, comforted in other ways, horrified by the fact that other people have gone through very similar things yes. before. <laughs> I suppose so. Yes, it's uh, it it depends on your viewpoint. It depends on on how much you want to be comforted and how much you want to be horrified. I suppose. <laughs> yeah, glass half empty or half full. Yes. Well, with all of that being said, um, I suppose that's everything for today, um, and we will be back in uh, two weeks. You think? Yep. In a fortnight's time, two, absolutely. Two weeks for, with uh, the 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 finale of this episode or of this series. Um, absolutely. I look forward Looking to forward. that. So brilliant! Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, look forward to another year full of histories. Most um, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm I'm hoping that 2021 will be a better year for all of us. Right? <laughs> Let's hope so. So, so. All right. Well, uh, with every, all that being said, my name is Peter, and I'm Alex. And thanks for listening. History's most. Mm-hmm.